Hi there, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Welcome back. It's nice to see you. Um, we're back tonight for Shannon's second and, believe it or not, final lecture of her of the semester, having Shannon as our critical studies fellow here on campus. I, I know it's hard to imagine that we're already in the middle of the semester, but here we are. Um, time is really flying. So that means you've still got this much more time in this semester to keep taking advantage of Shannon and having her here. So I hope that you'll do that. Of course, today is an important day for a lot of other reasons, um, most of which are being marked by coloring in little tiny ovals on paper, um, on ballots across the country. So I hope that those of you who are eligible to vote have done so either here in Michigan or by absentee ballot in your home state. And if you haven't voted, polls are open until 8 o'clock tonight. Um, I'd like, to, locally that is, and I'd like to thank you for rearranging your day so that you could come hear Shannon um, a little earlier and then later we'll all be able to be glued to our computers and TVs and radios um, this evening. And I know that it is a tall order for Shannon to present a lecture, a lecture on election day, but as I thought about the subjects and discussions and readings that she's introduced to Cranbrook, I thought a lot about individual and collective agency. What I found refreshing, particularly in the readings and also from her first lecture, is her recognition that individual and collective agency is, whether that's an artist enterprise or a curatorial project or a space making project, these things are not rosy, they are not neat, and they are not easy. Um, Shannon has laid out some of the ways in which charting your own course as an artist, a um, as a collaboration, or as an alternative to alternatives is fraught with complications, histories, conventions, and certainly contradictions. And yet many artists, designers, and culture workers remain very dedicated and find the optimism to strike out and produce their own versions of what they want to see, whether that's an artist-run gallery or an artist-run school, a social design garden, or a performance food truck. The optimism and the actual doing of these things and these projects is not squashed by the complications and contradictions, I guess is, is my point. And today it seems like a good day to be uh, reminded of that. So thank you to Shannon for um, your work in the fellowship so far. I know that she's had conversations with many of you already. We do have some more time, um, so please uh, do seek Shannon out if you haven't had a chance to meet and talk with her yet. And I'd like to thank her particularly for initiating a special seminar that she's running called Making Space for Culture. It really takes advantage of exactly what we had designed the fellowship to do, which is to bring students of various departments together for a multidisciplinary conversation on subjects that are both of interest to you as students, but also to Shannon as a professional and as a fellow using this time for her own research and activities. So it's really wonderful to see the aim of that program come to life in this way. Please help me welcome Shannon back to the podium. everyone. Um, thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, today, uh, well, for my first lecture, as you probably recall, um, I talked primarily about my experience and sort of where I had gotten to um, in terms of my work as a grassroots arts administrator, which um, frames a lot of the uh, seminar that Sarah mentioned, Making Space for Culture. Um, tonight, my lecture, Auxiliary Motors and Affect Machines, is uh, a little bit more distinctly about uh, the kinds of uh, curatorial work I've been doing over the last decade since I moved away from having a discrete studio practice. Um, for me, this is kind of a, a working lecture. It's uh, one of the great um, benefits of coming to do something like this fellowship is you get an opportunity to reflect on your own work and do some writing and some research and try to piece together the things that you've been doing for the last 10 years and put it into words. Um, and uh, this kind of opportunity for reflection is sort of starting, I think, with this document, um, which uh, is missing a few pieces. Um, you know, it's something that I hope to be able to revisit a little bit more. But as I said, is uh, starting to kind of look at the threads that connect uh, the various projects I've been doing over the past few years um, outside of Three Walls. So this is talking about um, curatorial work that doesn't exist necessarily there. Um, so if I were to summarize my interest in being in the arts, 
I've got to get this thing at the right height here. <laughs> if I were to summarize my interest in being in the arts, it's probably an eternal fascination with the relationship between humans and things. That fascination has put a notable strain on my attention span, uh, leading me to be as equally interested in antique malls, dollar stores, drug stores, basements, uh, car floors, dust drawers, as I am in museums, galleries, and actual artists and their art. When I began to make less art, finding that the direct relationship between me and the products of me was a bit too restrictive, I began curating or organizing situations for the contemplation of and relating to things. And that necessarily resulted in projects that dealt explicitly with the relationship between humans and things and how those relationships might be productive or poetic. And this is an image of marzipan from my favorite Italian deli in Brooklyn, which is up here because for me, this is one of the most kind of spectacular examples of choosing or the perfect thing um, from a, an assortment of seemingly identical things, uh, ostensibly, uh, it's, it's all marzipan, it all tastes the same, but there's about, there had to be, you know, 75 or 100 different pieces and shapes of marzipan one could possibly choose. Um, so that is to say that I'm interested in how things can be evocative or how experiencing objects can be a form of thinking or a mnemonic vessel. As Christopher Ballas explains it, Quote, we do not know why we choose objects, but certainly one reason is because of their experience potential. As each object provides textures of self-experience, we need the object to release ourself into self-expression. One of the first shows I curated collaboratively was the exhibition Without Which Nothing. It was about the intimacies constructed between artistic materials and process that were chosen by the artists to picture time and how that might be translated to the audience without the advantage of touch or use. And of course, this is one of those moments where all of the images of this show have been lost. So I have a couple images of work that were in the show. Um, this first image is uh, by one of the artists, Linda Molnair, who's a Dutch artist, who at the time was working on a series of objects. She'd make one a week for 52 weeks. And the piece here, this walking stick, um, week number 17, was one of the um, seven objects of hers that we showed. And uh, as you can see, it's a man's walking stick with an artificial knee inserted into the middle of it. If you screwed off the head of the cane, there was a hidden chamber with a cigar inside. Um, so working with three artists, Linda Molnair pictured here, David Banga, who is a ceramicist who had a practice of um, firing and uh, reglazing and refiring and reglazing pots in um, a pit fire. And uh, William Gerhardt, who was uh, um, making paper fades from black construction paper that he would uh, slowly sort of gradiate and leave out in the sun until he had a gradual um, fade that marked time. Um, so working with these three artists, uh, my collaborator Jeff Ward and I assembled an exhibition that threw a kind of shared palette exaggerated display techniques like height of objects, the spacing between them and the lighting, which I'm sorry I can't show you, and an emphasis on subtle and particular techniques and their practices, wanted to emphasize the relationships of these things to one another, the space and the viewer, and ask questions like, how does the object choose you? Do you really choose the object? And what happens in the pregnant pauses between these things in space? What is muttered in the darkened corners as you move from one display to the next, mentally selecting your favorite and why? These are William's paper fades. And while you may have read the artist's statements and considered them as you look at, say, William's sun-faded construction paper, how are new meanings made from your relationship to the work, for yourself, through your attraction and communication with them as individuals? Without which nothing relied a lot on referring to the things in the show as individuals. Not quite personification, but maybe implying that they had souls of their own. While the show was handsome, and I think the outcome might have been far more subtle than our intentions, I won't say it failed, but it was kind of pretentious. Not necessarily because it was hung so sparsely, but because the connection between the work selected and the language of the exhibition, um, and at least my interests in the premise, seemed to kind of misfire. While elegant, the need I have to explore what is communicated be human, between humans and things was not wholly satisfied. 
Robert Morris once said that he wanted to provide situations where people could become more aware of their own experience rather than more aware of some version of his experience. And needless to say, this is something that drives my practice of curating. The difficult thing with applying this motivation to the work of curating, especially when outside of an institution, is that it involves a different negotiation, one with artists and their practices and the objects as well as the space and the audience. Artists have to be interested in something fairly similar. In fact, they need to be willing collaborators or at least co-conspirators in order for this relationship to work. And while I'm very interested in artists, I'm very interested in people and things, and that means I'm very interested in the people looking at and interacting with the things that have been shown to them. And this is an image of a piece by filmmaker Danny Leventhal, who um, we did show at Three Walls probably in about 2005. And um, I really like uh, this particular slide because it's a wholly interactive piece. In order to really kind of understand it, you need to get up and walk around it. Um, it's a concentric platform, as you can tell, uh, built from the uh, shipping crates or shipping um, platforms that were around our neighborhood in the West Loop, which is a meatpacking district. And Danny repurposed them to create um, this walkway that starts with the rough, kind of unfinished um, uh, shipping pallet as the base and then works its way up to an apex at the top that's only large enough for one person to precariously stand on. And that area, oh, I forgot that there's a laser pointer here. Woo, oh, that area right there is a tiny little spot that she finished like parquet flooring. So it's really refined and polished and sanded, but made from pallets. So um, the metaphor obviously being that more people fit down here and it's lonely up here and precarious. Um, Fluxus, minimalism, and today's social practice have all engaged in a negotiation of the terms between art and audience. Where Capra wanted to eliminate the audience and the convention that separates art into makers and observers, minimalism argued that participation is elicited when work invited completion through perpetual bodily interaction. The social turn in art can demand quite a bit more from the audience, requiring them to become participants or even partners through a set of prescribed or suggested actions that achieve the artwork's intentions through an, ex an explicit engagement. But I'm still stubbornly interested in the simplicity of Morris's statement as representative of a certain kind of consistent desire to explore experience and let go of the control curators and artists want to have over their work and who makes the meaning. So I guess I took Barth very seriously when I was an undergraduate. Not that I believe that authors wholly die. Sometimes they hang around like ghosts or even zombies, attempting to erect cumbersome stumbling blocks in the paths of audiences. I might accuse museums of being the worst and most evident zombies, framing the frame so many times that there is little room left for pleasure. The Tate Modern began using their turbine hall in 2000 as a site for annual commissions that would provide a space for bodies to be a little bit more relaxed in the context of art, giving them full opportunity to experience work beyond just the visual register and with permission to lie down, eat food, take pictures, and play. While I never saw Karsten Haller's test site pictured here in situ, I did see one of his slides in his solo show experience at the New Museum last year, um, a show which I actually thoroughly hated because um, it seemed to kind of humor audiences um, with the idea of engagement. However, Haller's test site slide um, pictured here, which is the seventh slide that he would install. When it debuted in Turbine Hall, critic Dorothea von Hanelman's description of it does warrant some repeating. Quote, Haller's slides dr strive towards a subversion and reorganization of precisely those values that the museum cultivates. Against the museum is a machine for control and rationalization. They propose ecstasy and euphoria. Against the self-reflected and self-controlled visitor, they produce or provoke a visitor who is ready to lose his mind and be transformed. I'm not totally sure if you'd lose your mind under these circumstances. Uh, slides actually exist outside museums, as we all know. But perhaps the invitation to do so in this space has the potential to be truly euphoric for those who do live const constantly within a controlled and rationalized environment. And as Susan Sontag said, in place of a hermeneutics, we need an erotics of art. 
Of course, in contrast, the playful audience in Turbine Hall grossly misinterpreted the gravity of Dora Salcedo's shibboleth, a crack in the floor that grew across the hall into a two-foot-deep chasm on the other side, meant to represent the societal fault line between rich and poor, white and non-white, included and excluded. Shibboleth became known as the crack in the popular pe press, much like Anish Kapoor's Cloud Gate in Chicago has become known as the bean. But as Helen Reese Leahy points out in her paper, Watch Your Step, quote, for many the process of making meaning was a physical and social performance. Hands were held across the crack at its widest points. Children stood arms akimbo over it, peering downwards. Groups clustered as if in consultation at points where it deepened and changed direction. In spring 2013, I've organized an exhibition at the Soap Factory in Minneapolis of sculpture. It grew out of an interest in dissolving the categorical way history has divided up artistic practice in relationship to audience along the lines of these different fluxus minimalist or social practice principles. There's a great deal of slippage between the elimination of the audience, the theatrics of minimalism, and the explicit participation in social practice in the attempt to either engage an audience knowingly or respond to their presence. While all these principles reflect an artist's mindful relationship to audience, they don't always acknowledge that there already exists a relationship proposed between art and audience that is relational. This is where the title of my talk comes in, Auxiliary Motors and Affect Machines. The auxiliary motor is the complementary force that puts the affective machine into motion. The affect machines are the things around us. I borrowed the term from a crit panel I was in last spring when a student described their project as a kind of affective machine. And my co-panelist, filmmaker Daniel Eisenberg, exclaimed, all art should be affect machines. And I totally agree, and I quickly scribbled that down for future use, which is right now. When thinking about the show for the Soap Factory, currently titled Resonating Bodies, but maybe should be changed to auxiliary motors and affect machines, I was thinking about people as the motor that made art work. They stepped up in, they stepped up or in, and everything starts rolling and humming and clipping along. This relationship between the auxiliary motor and affect machine implies that all art is relational, and it is the meeting of the two that begins the process of making meaning. Perhaps their encounter results in a kind of perpetual motion machine, so long as they stay interlocked. Resonating Bodies in its current state curates seven artists who each work in sculpture and audience. I don't know if they would say sculpture and audience, um, but that's a liberty I'm going to take. To various ends, the work in the show demonstrates the complicated ways that audience is always implicated in the completion of an artwork. Although to some degree each artist invites explicit participation, the audience is situated to activate the work in different ways, as interlocutor, as motor, as witness, and implied force. The tension between the artwork and the audience resonates in each of these practices, addressing how studio practice both take up the role of the host, the creative generator of platforms and sites for action or spectacle, while playing host to the parasitic audience that both activates but also consumes and often changes the artwork. The image that's up right now is one of the artists um, for the show, Kelly Kaczynski. And this is an older piece. Um, it's a stack of two stages um, that fills the entire space. It's a bit deceiving, but there's actually only a very narrow walkway here. Um, and as you circumnavigated the stage, you would look down inside of it and see yourself reflected up through a base of mirror that was on the inside. Um, the second image is of Ben Fain's work. He's another artist in Resonating Bodies who has been uh, slowly building a practice of creating um, parades around the country, either the entire parade or just uh, single floats that infiltrate other parades. Um, all of them kind of built in this uh, really kind of wonderful abject fashion. Um, so in fact, one of the things I'm most curious about with the work in this show is how well sculpture has always been subject to the position of the audience in relation to its form and appraisal. These projects leave themselves somewhat bare. They're generous, or they attempt to be generous. And there's a raw, almost vulnerable quality to this work that is challenged by its sheer size. 
The Soap Factory is a unique venue. It's 48,000 square feet with 10,000 square feet of open programming space in a sprawling um, old soap factory in Minneapolis. Left quite bare, it challenges the art exhibited there to deal with the tremendous height of the ceilings and the raw wooden brick industrial architecture. I proposed resonating bodies to the space because the work by and large needs cavernous space to exist, let alone have the opportunity to coexist in an environment with other pe projects of similar stature. The current title of the show is taken from a Jan von Wert quote. Quote, a body of work that offers something for others to share is a resonating body that makes the voices of many others resound. The Soap Factory can share in that label with the artwork as an alternative space, a platform with a history that amplifies the voices of the artists within it. Just as the artists I chose provide a variety of types of platforms for exchange that go beyond the pragmatic motivations we associate with social practice. Conrad Freiburg, pictured here, for example, is assembling a series of these sound pods throughout the space, an extension of its interest in structures that sculpt sound, where musicians will be programmed to play throughout the exhibition or invited to drop in at their leisure. I also hope to reinstall Lori Palmer's Hole, a piece we did exhibit at Three Walls this past spring. Constructed of boards from demolished houses, Hole is partnered with a chairlift rigged up with acrobats rigging and a quartz counterweight. It requires one person to lift another in order to contemplate the structure from a solitary perch above the sculpture. It's me and my dog. To some degree, and that is the inside view. To some degree, resonating bodies came out of the exhibition Gestures of Resistance, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, which I co-curated with Judith Lehman in 2010. This show is specifically interested in the social turn and craft and the emerging prevalence of artists accessing craft as a performative practice. This is an overview of Gestures of Resistance about midway through the show, and we're hosting um, a meeting there for op um, a discussion there during open engagement. Uh, the design of the exhibition had been a major component in the presentation of the work and sought a strategy that would connect the work of the artists in the exhibition through their work actually overlapping and butting into each other by their own design, meaning that the artists made, had control over what work they left behind and how it was hung and where it was hung. Um, so whereas the show is very explicitly about the dynamics of social exchange of work and its performance, Resonating Bodies is going to back up and leave room for the multiple ways audiences can activate. For Gestures of Resistance, Judy and I were interested in the connections happening between disciplines and studying the relationship that this marriage created with an audience, locating them as both onlooker and participant depending on the work, but engaging a certain sense of the tactile through known gestures and bodily labors. Gestures of Resistance started as a panel at the CAA conference in Dallas in 2008 and brought together a group of artists and writers to engage in the topic of craft and performance, as it also intersected with slowness as a method for resistance. Later, it evolved into this exhibition that in 2010 was featured for five months at the museum in Portland. Its realization in a traditional museum and a craft-specific museum at that had interesting repercussions on the design. Gestures of Resistance invited eight artists, collaborators Sarah Black and John Preuss, who are pictured here, Anthea Black, Manglar Lam, Carol Lung, Theaster Gates, Kat Maza, and Aaron Toole to complete site-specific residencies in Portland. Their performative and often social work evolving both around the city and the museum in the context of the exhibition. The exhibition commenced with Black and Preuss building out what would be the studio for each artist's performance, the structure that you saw on the first slide of the show as well as a meeting place where an audience could sit and talk to the artists or each other. Black and Preuss's build-out was a performance of that collaboration, and this is them working. Titled Rebuilding Mayfield after the record longest game of telephone played, the build-out consisted of Black and Preuss erecting a wall, which you see running straight down the middle, that would separate them from one another, and it was later removed, through which they would take turns making design and craft decisions around the construction of the site. They could communicate these decisions to one another through the wall, which you see them doing here, and you see in this previous slide of Sarah listening to John talking to her on the other side. Um, 
They would communicate their decisions to one another through the wall without seeing what the other had done and attempt to mirror their collaborators' work on their side. Due to the unique architecture of the museum, this process was visible from multiple angles, from outside the vitrine-like windows that surrounded the ground floor gallery, or from above, from the balcony, which is where this photo is taken, that overlooked the ground floor, which was a pretty spectacular view, really, for the evolving build-out. The perfect place to witness their rather uncanny ability for them to mirror each other's work. After Black and Price had completed the site, the wall was removed and rebuilding Mayfield became the grounds on which other artists' performative work operated. Carol Lung and Anthea Black, for example, had performances that happened on Portland streets. And this is Carol Lung uh, working on one of her knockoff uh, projects. Um, essentially, she's um, copying uh, sportswear out of these Safeway plastic bags, but she's doing them um, by with a pedal-powered sewing machine, so volunteers would come and power the machine and sort of be integrated into the work process of, of the, uh, labor of, uh, the labor of textile work. Um, so artists like Carol and Anthea uh, left, the gallery became a place for their materials, preparation, and discussion, whereas other artists like Aaron Toole, Kat Maza, and Manglar Lam set up for the duration of their time, or their residency, directly in the space and used it as their studio. All of the artists manipulated the exhibit with each of their studios and performances and chose what to leave behind and how to leave it. From Manglar Lam's austere ironings, whose hanging and display by the artist is as much part of the work as the ironing of the cloth itself, to Aaron Toole's cups, which were made from the attempt to throw 1,000 pounds of porcelain within the allotted time of his stay, which he didn't quite achieve, and were given away to the museum visitors as they browsed the exhibition. And then after Tool, the final resident, Theaster Gates, provided a final two-day performance, a whitewashing of the exhibition and the museum in a porcelain slip. The exhibition changed constantly due to the artist's decisions in the space, but we attempted to maintain some cohesiveness through a set of didactic panels that would come down off the wall and be set up at the entrance during each artist's residency and a studio, a study, <coughs> pardon me, a study center upstairs that gave museum visitors some background into the studios and performance on the ground floor. And that's post uh, the Aster. You can see over here the little um, didactic panels that we'd pull out and set up. We were struck by the conflict between responses to the show and how to experience it. Some friends told me they wished there had been less didactics. The museum claimed that audiences were lost without even more information. Docents who were with the show through its entirety were enthusiastic about the format as they watched the various incarnations of the exhibit, each residency, performance, and the audience interacting with it itself. The museum expressed concerns that audiences didn't get it because they couldn't see everything at once. But Judy and I wondered if that really meant an automatic fail in understanding. We heard many reports of repeat visitors who attempted to follow the format of the show. While naturally, there were also visitors who would only be able to or interested in visiting once. But the fact that there was a different show nearly every week and to some degree a very distinct experience to have that differed significantly from one another seemed important to the exhibition as a whole. To see Manglar Lam performing ironings or happen upon the show and shop Aaron Toole's newly fired cups from the bunker that surrounded him or simply see the show or studio at rest all provide a sense of action and interaction that would be hard to interpret from a more static, traditional craft museum style study center upstairs. The action downstairs drove the work forward, kept its story in play in a way that the framing inherent in museums otherwise arrests work in time. While an audience might be more familiar with that, I remain optimistic that seeing an activated space at any stage of an exhibition could lead to more complicated interpretation of an object once it was detached from its performance. Gestures of resistance left me wondering how to frame an exhibition as a performance itself, where it had begun with the premise of shared and evolving workspace that would accumulate each artist's practice, the marks they chose to leave. The show itself was still the accumulation of discrete practices that while they may share similar premises, 
only coexisted through their accumulation of things that each artist chose to leave behind. This past spring for a project called Showroom, I used a white carpet as both a platform and a constraint. I invited three artists, Carson, Fisk, Vittori, Julia Klein, and Laura Davis to respond to the object as a prompt to design an exhibition about display through the commingling of their objects. All three artists' individual practices address the interconnection between display and the domestic, living with objects and objects living with each other. But asking them to share their research, sensibilities and things, both their artwork and studio artifacts, through a collaborative exhibition design was an attempt at extending that sensibility beyond the parameters of an artwork singularity. So there's the sort of a front side of the carpet and then a view of the back side. To return to Ballas, this exploration of display and decoration or the choice of objects and how they are used responds to the idea that the fashioning of life itself is something like an aesthetic. As he points out, quote, there is a particular urge to fashion a life and this destiny drive is the ceaseless effort to select and use objects in order to give lived expression to one's true self. Apart from the white carpet, the only other prompt was the discussion the four of us had around the slippage between the retail showroom, the gallery, and the domestic arena. After visiting everyone's studios together for an afternoon, the carpet was ordered and placed and left for Carson, Julia, and Laura's hands, who spent nearly two weeks bringing objects in and out, arranging and rearranging, setting up and abandoning new constraints and prompts between them. And it's interesting that the show ended up being so sparse because the sheer amount of stuff that they brought in and worked with and the number of changes that happened was phenomenal. Um, but documenting that and showing it was not the content of this particular show. So the result was an installation where the artists made the carpet off limits, giving the audience a narrow pathway on which to take in a series of vignettes and totems constructed from stool-shaped sculptures, brightly colored grocery items and display fixtures with the soft hum of a sound machine plugged into the wall that filled the air. The carpet, vacuumed carefully to conceal any footprints, was a menacing creature, simultaneously conjuring up off-limits parlors and department store tableaus, turning everything resting on it into an exotic static creature, tantalizingly just out of reach. In a review of the show for Art Writ, Anthony Romero talks about the process for showroom in performance terms, a kind of call and response, particularly familiar to the Goat Island School of Performance that produces encounters rather than merely organizing an exhibit. He describes that process as one that moves the role of the curator from a position of authority while freeing it from understatement, suggesting that a curator might be more akin to a director, that rather than positioning and naming works, can present the essence of an artist's practice alongside its documents. Going forward, I've been inspired by some individual artists' practices and the constraints they have provided themselves for projects as methods for their own curation and exhibition making around the idea of things, their arrangement and choice, and often with a generous interest in the language of retail, sales, and display as part of that content. Carson Fisk Vittori, who was a part of Showroom, collaborated with Elizabeth Abrahamson and Sola Shimi on the Northwest Flower and Garden Show, where the three applied for and manned a booth for a weekend in Seattle as an exhibition. There they simply existed in a humble setup, and they made their work, temporary sculptures, videos, and photographs from a few materials that they brought and many they acquired from around the show. Their subtle intervention in the space became the prompt for a body of work that happened in situ, both an exhibition and a vehicle for the production of further work that exists today online or is rumor either between artists or between visitors to the show itself. One of whom you overhear in a, one of their videos, um, Untitled Demo, a man walks by and remarks, there must be some good drugs here, as he passes Sol and Elizabeth lying on the floor of their booth. And I'm just going to play a short video. Uh-oh. I need to connect to WebSense area. <laughs> One moment, please. Let's 
So I'm going to just show this short video that they made out of um, at the Northwest Home and Garden Show, which is now kind of a part of those living documents. Destiny's Child is another collaborative infiltrating the language of retail, consisting of artists April Childers and Carmen Tiffany, who make a selection of products under this moniker, setting up temporary stores and making online-only advertisements for products ranging from oscillating ashtrays to Destiny's Child brand pickles with Google eyes. And I'm also going to let this them speak for themselves here. Brooklyn was the perfect place to bring our convenience so that everyone could enjoy them. We could go ahead and get the party started. I would say the oscillating ashtray was the first thing that really um, brought everything together. The oscillating ashtray and the old people food, but I'm, I've never had it, but I like the idea of it. Destiny's, Destiny's Child, Child bringing you the most convenient stuff around. Please visit us, destinyschild.org or on Facebook. That's like a dream. I wanted to speak to you a moment about our new product. Destiny's Child Pickles, April and Carmen, and I must say they are very delicious. It does seem like the new thing today is to go back to olden times, or to the country, or what have you. And this has actually been happening a lot. Yo, 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 turn it up, turn it up! I think about three years ago I first heard Destiny's Child, Destiny's Child, you know, infinite number of times. Say my name, say my name. Every day um, I get up, go on the computer, surf the Destiny's Child website's latest news, watch their videos. When I get home, it's the same thing, Destiny's Child on my computer. I think I followed in my brother's footsteps because just basically a lot of the things that he does rubs off on me and eventually I too turn into a Destiny's Child fan. The leader of the team, the father or mother of the work family, the managing director, the chairman, the CEO. 
and increasingly this person, with supreme pressures and stresses on his or her shoulders, is in danger of becoming isolated. The difference between a great and a mediocre leader is often determined by the degree of simplicity with which he or she views the job. I'd like to talk about destiny. What is your destiny? Parker Branch is another uh, group uh, based in London, Ontario, who is a collaborative that explores the intersection between art, display, and retail. Partners Anna Medelska and Jason Hollows have taken over a small shop space where in the tiny front half, uh, they display a grouping of objects that sometimes, but doesn't often include an art object in an arrangement that conjures up um, small amateur muse museums. Their pairings are constructed from systems of language, literary connections, or other poetic conjunctions that allow their choices to resonate, but perhaps not overwhelm each other. And meanwhile, not, while not her art practice per se, Nancy Shaver's shop Henry in Hudson, New York, has a reputation for being a purveyor of special objects, odds and ends that carry with them a kind of richness in their materiality. Exaggerating the strange relationship we have to authorship and value, Shaver mounted the show Retail at Feature Inc. in 2007, where she combined objects from her shop with her own sculptures. You can see her work on the top left and the show at the bottom right. Um, her brightly painted boxes stacked and nestled inside other found boxes. A review for the show in Art Critical commented on the sharp difference in price between the things that the artist considers high art and those that remain curios, notably that Shaver's work sold for as much as $65,000, while one such curio in the exhibit was only 50. But as Shaver points out in an interview about the show, quote, she wanted to flatten the hierarchies that divide art from non-art, to dirty the white walls and create an overload of visual information. With that in mind, years ago I exhibited this installation, Restless, at Green Lantern, a local artist-run space in Chicago. Restless was a more explicit encounter with humans and their things than my other curatorial experiments. I made an open call to people in the city to donate their collections to the show, which were laid out in the space like a kind of garden inspired by art environments by self-taught and vernacular artists. In the back, a record player played a recording of me singing all 12 of Jimmy Rogers' Blue Yodels, which are basically a series of blues songs about rambling and being on the road if you don't know Jimmy Rogers. <laughs> um, visitors could walk paths through the garden to inspect the collections and reach the sound installation or they could take it in at a distance. Things on display ranged from Pez dispensers to an immense number of decommissioned Starbucks cards which made up the bulk of this like tiling on the floor. The effect was intentionally to blur the line between the collector of things who means to represent the best example of and the collector who accumulates for mass, or for that matter, the collector who keeps out of sentiment or for other personal criteria. In blurring these lines, I wanted to create a space that spoke about how people use their things regardless of their perceived high or low cultural status to both protect and isolate themselves. Things can form a foundation that anchor us in place and is also be a salve for our desire or ramblings, while also constructing a unique universe under the jurisdiction of our own idiosyncratic rules. So I had prior to showroom been contemplating places where our expectations for display might overlap with art and curation. And this is another of Carson's photographs. And showroom had in some part been a first exercise in that. What had perhaps been missing was the possibility of browsing the display more intimately and quote unquote shopping it leaving the possibility of its ongoing appearance in the hands of a customer audience who might leave with a few bottles of lemon juice or absentmindedly move the Airwick package from the wig stand, making some new relationship appear when it was left by the Sprite. I want that chance to be allowed and to occur with perhaps more invisible constraint than evident in a usual retail or gallery environment. So uh, welcome to the heart of Ohio Antique Center, located in the I on the I-70 near Springfield, Ohio. 
They boast it being America's biggest and best antique center with over 400 booths and 300 Optimum View showcases. According to their dealer packet, Martha Stewart's Living Magazine has chosen them as one of the best sources for antiques and decorative collectibles in the country. Needless to say, with the largest booth running uh, at around $261 a month, including electricity, this is some of the cheapest space available for a gallery. Now, it's a little unfair to talk about something that hasn't happened yet, um, because that's a little bit like students and crits who show you one thing and say that it's going to rep represent a whole other project that has yet to happen, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, I want to end talking about some research because for someone like me, that means a lot of project planning and speculation. Um, Remora is a two-year series of two-month-long exhibitions that I hope to have in my booth at the Heart of Ohio Antique Center. Of course, like any fair, the Heart of Ohio has to accept my application, and I may or may not be on a waiting list depending on the demand. The concept of Remora is to collaborate with a curated group of artists, uh, many of whom I just showed you, who are interested in questions about display, decoration, retail collection or acquisition, memory, nostalgia, and other kinds of topics that intersect with those of an antique mall in exhibitions within a 10 by 10 stall, a kind of two year long ever changing group show. It'll all be about 24 artists total. The constraint for the show is in that context, but the installations of collaboratives or pairings of artists is not bound by old things. Troy Briggs, who I showed in my last lecture, is one of the artists I um, have asked to participate. Um, Briggs has installed a number of portals, which is what's, what this is right here, as part of his practice. They're earphone jacks that show up in surprising places like walls and park benches, where if you have earbuds on you and you plug in, you might, for example, be transported to the inside of a child's closet, which is where this earphone jack took you to a live feed. Um, and it turns out that a closet is a beautiful resonant chamber that picks up on subtle sounds both inside and outside the house. In a place where many people go for a brief escape through the contemplation of material culture, what would happen if offered yet another portal for absorption? Needless to say, I also just take sheer delight in wondering who might actually find the portal and use it, and never actually being able to satiate my curiosity, I think is the power of Briggs' work in itself. And it's a very generous abandonment by the artist. As indicated by Briggs' abandonment, the stall itself isn't intended in any way to announce itself as a gallery, and I suspect for the most part it won't even do so by accident, since one of the reasons I'm interested in this place as a site is the fact that antiques dealers have already curated their stalls and display cases in ways that are remarkable, and then they leave them to light maintenance by the mall staff. I grew up going to these malls in the West when my family went on holidays in the US and I was always attracted to the vignettes each dealer created in their stall, whether it was a time period, a color scheme, or just a thoughtful juxtaposition of content. Walking sticks and stools maybe, for example. And while not everyone's a great curator or retailer, uh, and some malls can be downright junky, for the most part these spaces presented thoughtful relationships between things. As a child I was drawn to the fact that here, history was tactile. I could sort through and touch the past in a matter of a few hours through an abundance of material culture. And while we understand that a museum and its curators are charged with selecting the best and the most pertin pertinent examples of that history for only our eyes to consider, the antique mall lets our fingers experience history in a more personal, intimate, and everyday level making meaning and narrative from a jumble of materials regardless of whether you buy anything. The fractured narratives that emerge from that experience are plenty, and even the dealer's curatorial decisions make attempts at framing them. As Jeff and I had very humbly attempted and without which nothing, I'm more explicitly interested in a project like Remora, the way people make relationships with things, the way things choose people, the mall is a heightened environment for that, like an art fair perhaps, but clearly very different in its permanent and thoroughly, uh, very different as it is permanent and thoroughly without fanfare, pretense, or social obligation. It's a relatively private and quiet place. Despite the immense traffic that Heart of Ohio claims to get, 
The 116,000 square foot mall allows one's viewing experience to be pretty intimate, to the point that it seems downright irritating when anyone is within 10 feet of your personal reverie. As a venue, I'm interested in its perceived accessibility. It's on the highway. Anyone can pull off and come through. It's free to enter. You can stay as long as you like, or at least until they close, without feeling awkward. And while there are sales assistants wandering around you, unlike museum guards, they don't tell you not to touch. In fact, booths are unmanned, meaning that while each dealer is laid out in often perfect mid-century modern tableau, the chances of its layout evolving are high. And I've observed that although people's manners in here are remarkable, whoa, Nicki Minaj talks about being misunderstood and disliked. <laughs> ah, everything's falling apart. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Um, although I have observed <laughs> that people's um, manners in the mall are remarkable, the delicacy with which uh, browsers approach materials is more akin to in an environment where they are being plainly watched. So maybe history makes us cautious regardless of how we're accessing it. And the reasons people come are varied. There are as likely many casual observers as there are serious collectors. On one hand, there's the person who will make one small purchase, taking home an item that suddenly speaks to them in a voice louder than any other object does in the whole 116,000 square feet. On the other, there is the person who will enter with the express mission of finding something very particular. They are looking for the object more than it is looking for them. So the goal for Remora would be to subtly exist in these circumstances, an exhibition space that has left itself open to the possibility of unmonitored change and alteration and is interested in that slippage in meaning that might happen with relinquishing the control that the artists and curators normally want to have. Remora may sometimes only look like art, and this image, which uh, I showed a few slides ago, actually is an art piece by Randall Zott um, at, the, at the Heart of Ohio, Spring, uh, Heart of Ohio Antique Mall. Um, so it might sometimes look like art, or it might never. It's the context of its surroundings and the pressure that it will exude on the little 10 by 10 booth that excites me, and a certain curiosity about what minute pressure it might exude in return. Of course, for my application to be accepted, I have to offer something for sale. So the participating artists have to be willing to price the things they choose to show in their exhibitions. And to get our foot in the door, I need to have a thing that I say I sell that fills a quota that the mall finds lacking. So this is pretty much what I have to figure out, what I propose I'm offering and fulfill so that we are not evicted. Uh, that or be totally honest about the project and see if they are at all charmed. But um, while I'm not one to fall into artistic claims that they won't understand, it's kind of satisfying to me right now that frankly I'm not sure how to describe it. And maybe this is the final blurring of a curatorial line where no description is necessary at all. <laughs>